Okay, I'm going to actually wear this lapel mic and walk around a bit because I like to not stand at the podium. I find it much more um, personable to be a bit more connected with you guys. Thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, I decided to shake things up a bit from the normal talk that I would be giving, which would be exploring, broadly speaking, the interface between um, hypermobility syndromes, EDS, etc., uh, and the typical cluster of syndromes that forms uh, around them, um, and how that overlaps with mental health and mental disorder, and in particular, ADHD, which is something uh, that I particularly specialize in. I'm a consultant adult psychiatrist um, based in London in the UK. Um, I have uh, three main areas of interest. One is the interface between mind and body. The second is psychological trauma, but more importantly, how to clear psychological trauma from the body and mind. And adult ADHD. And it was uh, in my work of adult ADHD that I um, started noticing pattern that uh, my patients were uh, more commonly than would be expected describing features of hypermobility. And I asked the question 15 years ago, why? Um, and um, there are other talks that you can look at on that question. But today, I am talking to you about emotional regulation. And um, with a particular focus from a parent's perspective. But actually, I think some of the messages which uh, have been distilled down actually to their core are very relevant to everyone. So if you're not a parent, you don't have kids, and you're thinking, what am I doing standing here listening to this talk? Don't worry. There will be, hopefully, lots of very useful things. Um, I have to put my disclosure slide up briefly. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to um, think about um, emotional regulation. And I thought a useful way of doing that is just to show a summary slide um, of various different approaches to emotional regulation, and I will do that in a moment. We're going to consider what these things called emotions are and uh, how they are regulated or dysregulated and what that looks like. We're going to focus the lens particularly on um, HSD and EDS and think about why is there more propensity, higher propensity to emotional dysregulation with hypermobility syndromes. We're going to think about the importance of the other in terms of co-regulation and hopefully spend uh, a reasonable amount of time just thinking about some uh, top tips or ideas for managing emotions, managing your own emotions, but also and often in turn uh, helping young people manage their emotions better as well. So one of my hats is the director of a company called The Grove Practice and we run training for mental health practitioners, for psychotherapists and coaches, and increasingly doctors as well, online. And I have, over the last couple of years, been writing a brand new course, which is a diploma or certificate of advanced emotional regulation skills. And we just launched it, and we're halfway through it. It's a six-day course. And it's really great, because it's a synthesis of everything I think is important about how to better regulate yourself. Um, and I've tried to capture the sorts of things we're looking at. And I'll just give you a moment to have a look at that slide. You see, you can look at regulation of emotions uh, from the perspective of the body, and it's a really important perspective, and it's one that's really neglected in Western medicine particularly. Um, and obviously, there's various different aspects of the body, and there's more than, than actually I've listed there, but some of the ideas, the importance of the breath. There's also the mind and cognitive approaches and, and using creativity to regulate. But there is the environment, the space around us, and the uh, mechanism by which we interface with that space around us through our senses, not just five senses, but eight senses, in fact. We can think about aids and devices and resources that we can use to help better regulate, and some of them were mentioned in the last talk, actually. Um, there is the importance of understanding how we were designed not to be alone, but to be connected, and right from a very early age of, uh, with bonding between mother and infant and feeding. There is so much emphasis on co-regulation, and that it's so important that that 
um, that process goes relatively smoothly, and it often doesn't, and how that impacts relationships down the line. And thinking about lifestyle factors, diet and nutrition um, and sleep, um, etc. So some ideas there around how we might regulate emotions from different angles. So what are emotions? I think it's a really interesting question. They're essentially a, a cluster of, of inner experiences. So they may be physical experiences, emotional experiences, um, and then consequent behaviors that are very characteristic and they cluster together in a particular form. And they sort of represent things, they get triggered by things that are important to us. And they sometimes give us a boost and an impetus to go into action, to either move towards something or perhaps move away from something. They can be positive or negative, but they can often indicate as a, and serve as an indication of what we need. They are different from mood because they're distinct and they're short-lived, um, which is slightly different. So there are, in fact, six core emotions. I've listed them there, anger, disgust, sadness, happiness, surprise, and fear. But you can see from this emotion wheel that each of those six core emotions build into further layers of connected, related, but independent emotions. And you can get these online and, and have a look in more detail but just to orientate you to that. From the start, I think it's really important that we understand emotion to not be a thing that happens up here, but in fact is a very bodily experience. And Dr. Ian McGilchrist, uh, the author of uh, this book, which explored the difference between the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain very beautifully, and he compiled the evidence and really understood emotions at some depth, um, he said they're inseparable from the body. They are a bodily experience. Um, and for many of you, um, recent texts that have got um, following the body keeps the score um, follow that same messaging. So what does happen in the body? Well, when we get stressed, it's normal to get stressed, but when we get stressed and there's a perceived threat from the outside, whether it's a real threat or a perceived threat, is, is, is an important question. Our, there's two stress systems in our body kick into action. And the other talk that I'm going to give tomorrow, I'll go into more detail of the physiology, but the, that, the, main, the main stress system is the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight system. And it's really priming us to either to take on a fight or to run away, or perhaps with a more sophisticated look, if you're thinking through the polyvagal theory, to engage and try and find a solution that doesn't involve fighting or fleeing, um, talking down, connecting, and that's the social connectedness aspect of the polyvagal theory. But, you know, when we get activated and the emotions get triggered, uh, we feel it in our body, our heart rate goes up, our pupils dilate, there are changes on our skin, our skin, our hairs stand on end, and it's really important to recognize those changes the, the, the color of the skin, and often the gut changes, because if you don't need to, um, if you don't need to be using an organ system when you're running away or going into conflict, then it shuts down, essentially, and the, the gut tends to shut down uh, when we're stressed and it doesn't work as well. So often complaints of tummy ache or soreness or feeling sick in, in children uh, and young people is common. But we can often forget that dysregulation of emotion is not just the heightened anger, anxiety, agitation, um, high, um, uh, yeah, high externalizing. It can go the other way. And this shutting down, um, numbing out, uh, known as dissociation, is equally as important. And many children uh, learn to shut down, particularly from neglected environments. They learn to shut down. Uh, and, and the neglect may not be purposeful. It may be because of chronic illness in, in parents or substance use issues or all sorts of diff difficult social challenges. But um, there's a relative neglect, and people tend to respond to that um, by shutting down and becoming more dissociated later on in life. And here, I think this, this um, image uh, represents things quite nicely. There is a window, what we call a window of tolerance with emotions. 
into which we try and stay. Because if we don't, then we either go hyper-aroused, where uh, all the anxiety, anger, etc., or we go hypo-aroused, under-aroused, um, withdrawn, frozen, disconnected. And that's like heavily linked with depression, shame. Oops. So let's focus the lens briefly on dysregulated emotions in uh, EDS and HSD. Um, why do they happen? Well, I think the easy answer would be to say, well, of course, it's a chronic illness, and chronic illness is stressful, and therefore it's normal that emotions will become dysregulated. But there's a lot more to it than that. Um, there is a lifetime of being misunderstood, of not being listened to, of being perhaps accused of making up your symptoms because the person in front of you doesn't understand what they're seeing. And the fact that when you're hypermobile, as you probably can all experience, your system's set up because of the subtle changes in your sensory system, the proprioceptive changes, your awareness of your body space. Your system is set up and feels under threat. There is a sense of it's something's not safe, something's not right. And the energy that you might be using for other things is being used to hold your body together, to feel safe. And what you find is that people spend a lot of time in a low-level threat state, and they don't understand why. And that's your sympathetic nervous system being uh, on sort of a high alert. There are much higher levels of mental health problems and neurodiversity issues, ADHD and autism. And dysautonomia, you will, most of you will experience symptoms on standing, dizziness, lightheadedness, fainting. Uh, it's so common in this cluster. And if you don't get enough blood supply to the brain, whatever the mechanism, you're going to get brain failure. And what does brain failure look like? It, well, it looks like anxiety, and it looks like brain fog, or ADHD, or mood changes, or emotional dysregulation. And more and more we're understanding, and I'm very excited to hear uh, Dr. Anne Maitland speak tomorrow, I think, on mast cell activation syndrome. I think this is a very important area. And the inflammation that gets generated in the body from mast cell activation syndrome, in my opinion, and it is an opinion stage now because this is a, it's a newly defined disorder and still very misunderstood, but the, the inflammation that gets generated in the system goes to the brain. And what does brain inflammation look like? Well, it looks like anxiety and brain fog, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there's also families affected. And when families and systems are affected, problems in one person, the parent, was going to impact the whole dynamics of the family. And it's complicated. So often there are dysregulated emotions flying around in the family environment. And the thing I want to say about co-regulation can be summed up without me saying much, actually. So just take a moment to have a look at this slide. I think it says it all, really. The parent needs to stay regulated, even if the child is very dysregulated. And that's very difficult when you're in pain or you've got too much to do, or you're sensitive to noise, or you've got an anxiety issue, or you've got ADHD, or all of the above. So it's uh, not a surprise that there are challenges. Right, so let's twist the focus for the next six minutes and do like a quick focus on what we can do about it. I think the first thing to say is that when, there are, when there's dysregulation at play, do something. Do something different, make a change. Go outside, open the door, switch the TV on, switch the TV off. I don't know, do something that is going to create a shift change. And that something can be either trying to change yourself, your internal state, bearing in mind that you need to become regulated if, if, if you're dealing with children. Or it can be by changing something external. And that interface between in and out is very important. I think it's captured nicely with this slide that you know, our environment and what's around us and whether we're breathing fresh air or we're breathing uh, air that's in a mouldy room or we're breathing, we're surrounded by nice greenery or we're surrounded by concrete. It changes the way that we feel and we need to become more alert to that and see how we can shift 
the inputs that are coming in through our senses. I've shown the five senses here, but in fact, there's also the vestibular sense and the proprioceptive sense and the interoceptive sense. So, top tips for kids. I think they're useful for everyone. Modify the senses. We talked about these senses. What can you do about them? Well, I've just shown some examples here. You can change what you're looking at. You can change what you're smelling or you're listening to. Or you're, you can impact your taste buds and bring a shift change in that respect. Aromatherapy, very nice and calming. And different oils have calming effects. And lavender is particularly good for that. Um, but... I would say sort of top tips for children can be summarized in three words. Breathe, move, talk. So let's think about breathe first. Simple messaging around breath. Triangle breathing. Breathe in for three seconds. Let's all do it quickly. Breathe in for three seconds. Hold for three seconds and breathe out for three seconds. Very effective. About nine seconds, 10 seconds in total, which is ideal for optimal heart rate variability, but that's a different talk. There is also chocolate breathing, which is a particular favorite for uh, children, hot chocolate breathing. And you explain very simply, that imagine you're holding a hot cup of chocolate and you want to smell the chocolate, so you breathe in deeply through your nose. And then you want to, you realize that you're going to have a sip, it's so good, but you need to cool it down. So you blow and cool it down. So you use the hot chocolate idea. So we've talked about the breath, hot chocolate breathing and triangle breathing. Moving. Moving is really important. When our system is stressed, it needs to move to discharge the emotion. It's why it's important to, when you are really stressed or involved in a trauma, to walk or to actually run to like, execute that emotion. But it's also important to know when to move away, to take time out from something, where something's gone too far, and no amount of negotiation is going to help. Conversely, you've got to know when the time is to talk through things and to talk openly, and who can you trust to talk. Touch, really important. And we've really lost, even before COVID, we, we've lost something about touch. And it's so powerful. And touching is not just about touching the other, although that's exceptionally powerful, but it's about self-touch. And um, we have become a bit scared of being in touch with our body. And the workshop that I ran yesterday was all about connecting with the body. And touching other things as well, if you're sensory, can be extremely calming. So using touch to regulate is important. And there's just a, an image there, but I'm not going to labor on that point. Essentially, touch is important. And we can see that when people are stressed, their body language, it's not coincidental where the hands are going when someone is stressed. It indicates where in the body there are points for calming down the system. All of those points that are being touched by the fingers of those people are important acupuncture points that are known for quickly calming the system when you needle them, massage them, do whatever on them. But there are different ways of utilizing points in the body, and you can just see some of the points as they're laid out in this acupuncture doll. And the other thing that seems to be really important that's coming through in the, all the different um, treatment approaches, particularly for mental health stuff, EMDR, eye movement, and EFT, tapping, these all use repetitive stimulation, repetitive and rhythmical stimulation. It seems to be very important for processing emotion. And inherently, we know that to be the case because of all of these activities have something calming or regulating or mood changing about them. And uh, we, we are learning to utilize that in different approaches. And one of those approaches is being demonstrated by this chap who's tapping on acupuncture points. Uh, and, and it's an approach called emotional freedom techniques. And I think uh, it's, it's my top tip Top approach. Uh, it's, uh, you can read about it, and there's a book for parents, teenagers, and kids there as well. You just need to look it up. And there are the points. And if I had a few more minutes, we'd do it all together, but I don't. So we are going to just focus on these last two slides, which are the focus on parents, really. So what can parents take away um, 
the need to avoid saying calm down, that can be very aggravating. And as we said before, to stay calm and not to lose control and to validate, to hear the child and to provide some space. And importantly, not to try to fix or to assign blame. Right, I think that's all, folks. Thank you very much.